Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us once again. You've been with us the last session. You know that we've been discussing the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the most significant event in the universe's history. He's risen, he's been seen of people, but what have people thought of that resurrection? How have they accepted it or denied it? What has happened? Let's go to Paul into the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's start with verse uh, 3 and see what Paul claims happened here and then we can discuss what others have thought perhaps. Yes. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen also of me, as one of born out of due time. Mm -hmm. He oh. must have had quite a vision there on the Damascus yeah, Road. Yeah, really, really. But how, how has the resurrection been seen by, it's not, it's not accepted by, by the majority. So how, what do they think of it? Okay, well, and, and I would like to put that question to every one of you watching and to all of you who are here. What difference does all that make to our lives? <clears throat> How did it affect the disciples? Well, think about it for a minute. The Peter who was so uncertain of himself that when the maid pointed a finger at him, he said, oh, no, no, I don't know this Jesus. No, I'll cuss and swear to prove that I don't know this Jesus. And what happened a few weeks later? Well, let me just, let's just look at those verses because they're so important in our thinking here. Look at Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 4, and we, don't, we won't read the whole speech, um, starting from Acts chapter 4, starting with verse 5, but I'm going to drop down uh, to verse 12. Salvation, this is the end of Peter's speech to, to the Sanhedrin now. He's standing up in front of the Congress of his day. Salvation is to be found through him alone. In all the world, there's no one else whom God has given who can save us. They're talking about the one that they crucified. The members of the council were amazed to see how bold Peter and John were and to learn that they were ordinary men of no education. They realized then, what? That they had, that been. They had been companions of Jesus. And what happened? I mean, they had been companions of Jesus for three and a half years, and, and, and they still didn't amount to much of anything. I mean, they were, they were scared to death. They were behind locked doors over that weekend. So what happened? It had to be something to do with the resurrection, right? But I think it was important to them in ways that we could only wish that were important to us because they were in such depth of despair. Mm -hmm. And then to be raised out of that, mm -hmm. that's, that was a thing that... We well, what, what changed? What changed? There was the resurrection, and then there was uh, 40 days of them studying, 50 days, and then the Pentecost and the Holy Spirit came, and then they were emboldened. Why? Because the they knew that, that God ra would raise them to life again. I, I think there's something else that we sometimes overlook, and uh, uh, let me just propose it as a possibility. Those disciples 
began to realize that the person they had spent three and a half years together with, they had walked with him, slept with him, eaten with him, you know, day and night, ministered, healed people, et cetera, with him. They had sort of almost melted together with him. They'd been with him so much. And now all of a sudden they realize that that person was none other than God himself. No more fear on their part. What is there to be afraid of? That's the point. Nothing to be afraid of now. I mean, if someone kills you, what's Jesus going to do? He's going to raise you to life. There's nothing to be afraid of now. And Peter stands up, you know, if I had dropped back a couple of verses, it says, um, Peter and his, right, it says, the one you killed is, is the one, and I don't see the verse, verse right now, but 10. is it verse 10? Then you should all know, all the people of Israel should know that this man stands here before, you're talking about the one they had healed, completely well through the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from death. I mean, you know, they mu the Sanhedrin must have been shaking in their boots. Well, okay, having said that, their best friend was already in heaven. And if our best friend, if we recognize Jesus as our best friend, we should, be, we should feel the same way about him that they did. But now, you know that not everyone believes the stuff we've been talking about here. And there's, there's, o there's only two or three options as far as ex explanations for the, for the scripture, I mean for the this, this story. Let's look at those. Let's take an honest look at them. The resurrection of Jesus, some would claim, was a great hoax. In other words, the resurrection didn't really happen. Either he died and stayed dead or he was never really dead. It's a hoax. That's one possibility. We'll talk about some variations of Somebody that. Somebody stole his body. Or Whatever. Mm. Yeah. Mythology. <clears throat> the resurrection is fiction. What's the difference between one and two? Oh, well, like he suggested, so, you know, supposedly the disciples had figured out some way to go in there and, and steal his body away. He could have been a real person, the whole thing like this. They could have stolen his body away and said, guess what? He's raised from the dead. And all that could have really happened. Now, the idea that it's myth means the whole thing was just made, the story was made up. Jesus never really existed. It, the whole thing is So the first one recognizes his death, but the second, the mythology, doesn't recognize death or resurrection. Either, either that they the first one resurrects his death, or maybe that he didn't really die somehow, rather he, he, during that darkness he was, he, they snuck him down from the, from the cross, or, or something like that. In, any, any number of possibilities. We'll talk about some of them. And then the only other, the third possibility is that the it was the supreme event of history. In other words, the resurrection is fact. So we're talking about a falsehood, a fiction, or a fact. Those are the three possibilities. Now, what theories have come up to try to explain this? Well, one is that Jesus is swooned. What do we mean when we say swooned? Fainted. He fainted. So he didn't really die. He just looked like he was dead and they put him in the tomb and then a while later he woke up again. So they stuck a spear in a fainted guy. Yeah. <laughs> and he, then he was really fainted. And then he really fainted. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a little problem. That's, every one of these theories has problems, except the lateral one, the last one we're going to talk about. Some, call this, some say Jesus' spirit returned but not his body. So if you believe that the spirit and the soul are separable entities away from the body, then if you Jesus, believe Jesus died, then somehow or other his spirit comes back and it just looks like Jesus, but it's not really the real living Jesus, it's just his spirit or maybe his soul. Okay? A ghost. A ghost in an essence, okay? A third possibility is that it was only a vision. A vision. The disciples just thought they saw Jesus. It, they were hallucinating. They wanted him to be back so, so much that they had a collective hallucination, I guess. I, I've never heard of a collective hallucination, but it's, well, there are people who believe crazy things, but anyway. So he was still in the grave, but they hallucinated that he, yeah, okay. along with the guards. So the fourth theory, that the whole thing was just a legend or a myth. 
The resurrection is only a myth or, or story with a teaching point. A real Jesus is probable, but not really necessary. In other words, they made this whole story up to teach some important points, some, some good, nice messages. You know, you should, treat, you should be nice to your neighbors. You shouldn't, uh, uh, you know, commit adultery, kill, steal, lie, etc., etc. But the whole thing... Stuff. What? There's a lot of stuff that fits together, though. Yeah. It's true. Kind of like the flood and Jonah. Yeah. Job. Yeah. It's all yeah. myth. Okay. Another specific explanation is the stolen body theory. The body was stolen maybe by the Jews or possibly by the Romans. That would be interesting. By the disciples, and that's discussed in Matthew 28, 11 to 15, or possibly by Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. And why would he steal the body? Get his tomb back. Yeah. Have his tomb available yet when he needed it, right? <laughs> So those are some fast. stolen body <laughs> theories, okay? Another possibility is a wrong tomb. The disciples went to the wrong tomb, found an empty and erroneous and concluded that Jesus had risen. So maybe they were misguided. They went to the wrong place. That's easily where they didn't go. They would have just went to another one. That doesn't make sense. They, they should have found some dead bodies in it if they'd <laughs> gone to the wrong tomb, right? So then they, they lied about it by expanding the story with the Roman guards and everything. Sure, sure. Well, maybe it was a deliberate lie just for profit. The disciples fabricated, one theory is that the disciples fabricated the resurrection story just for profit. They didn't want to look like they had lost, that they had been defeated in this whole thing, so they made this story up, so they'd go out and announce it to the world, so they would get supported by announcing the story for the rest of their lives, until, of course, they died a martyr's death. And the question is, which one of these theories would you be willing to die for so far? If you knew it was one of those theories. Count me out. Count you out? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, another, a, a ninth, an eighth possibility is it was a mistaken identity. The, my, mis, the disciples mistook for Jesus someone who looked like him. So Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. They just found somebody that looked like Jesus and they said, Hooray! He's resurrected! Well, it says they didn't recognize him. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, until a certain point, and then they did. But still, that imposter had a lot of things to say. Mm -hmm. Some guy's running around with fake handprints. And mm -hmm. Yeah. And that would, scars on his was hand. enough to commit 11 of them to unnatural, 11 disciples to unnatural death? Make them willing to go out and live their lives at risk every day and finally die martyrs' deaths? I think they could have re recognized him had they been able to phantom the idea itself. Mm -hmm. I think I think it was so hard to believe for them. Mm -hmm. That's why they couldn't see him. Had well, their I, heart I, been open, they could have. I think they would have would have known right away. I, I personally believe that that a resurrection, a resurrected body. I don't think you'll look exactly the same. Um, even mm -hmm. Ellen White talks about that about the resurrected body that. Mm -hmm that we're going to be made out of better stuff and yeah. and though you'll be able to recognize us when you talk to us it may be not what do you so do much the, physically. What do you do with the resurrection of the wicked where they come out of the graves just like they went in? Well I'm just talking about physical looks. I'm not talking about necessarily so the, the evil. Not the glorified body, the ones that, the ones that aren't glorified. Well I don't, I we're can't answer rough, that. Well, of course, the, the, the final explanation is number nine that I hope we all would adopt, a literal bodily resurrection. Jesus was raised from the dead historically and bodily by the supernatural power of God, and that's, of course, what is suggested by 1 Corinthians 15.3 that Norm read to us. So those are the possibilities, and what was the result? Gordon sort of reeled that off for us very quickly. Would you like to, to do it again? What happened in the next 50 day, 40 days, 50 days? They studied. They brought things together. Their paradigm shifted. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit came on at Pentecost, and thousands were converted in a day. Okay. And, for the, and they spread the those people spread the gospel to the then known world in a short period of time. Wow. Amazing, isn't it? What a change. And where do we read the story of all that stuff you're talking about? Acts. In the book of Acts. So now we're ready to make that transition. We've completed the Gospels and we're ready to move over 
into the book of Acts. Um, now, we have been following a chronological sequence through scriptures. And so, Acts is what to the rest of the New Testament? The next moment. The next moment? The next moment after the Gospels. Okay, and extending to when? <coughs> Do we know? To the, the book of the Acts Paul. picks up from about 40 days after the resurrection to the time when Paul is imprisoned in Rome. Do we have any historical information beyond that? We have little bits and pieces in some of the letters. Uh, we can uh, letters. put together the stories from pieces in the letters and so forth. We know that Paul and Peter both died about the year AD 67, that um, John continued to live on, especially we don't know exactly the death, the timing of the death of most of the other disciples. We, we know that many of them died martyrs' deaths, if not all of them. John is the only one who apparently did live, die a martyr's death. He, exi he lived on until into the 90s AD, wrote Revelation, the Gospel of John, the three short letters, and then apparently died uh, of old age. So he went through the destruction of Jerusalem. Yes. He lived through the destruction of Jerusalem. It was probably somewhere nearby when it happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to just take a moment and, and talk about the sequence here. Um, some of you have the, the sequence in front of you. And by the way, if you're interested in, in looking at this sequence, uh, it's the first page in the study guide on the Book of Acts, the teacher's guide for the Book of Acts, and it's found on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. So if you'd like to look at the materials that we're sort of following along here, that's where they're available. And actually the teacher's guides. Yeah, under the teacher's guide. You can look at the study guides. That's there's some questions for you to think about, and those, those questions are answered if you turn to the teacher's guide. So let's look at the sequence. Now we have Jesus dying in the spring or being crucified in the spring, probably about April 14 to 16, somewhere in there, uh, the best we can nail it down in terms of our calendar, of the year AD 31. Um, he would have res been resurrected 50 days later. I mean, he would have resurrected on Sunday, but ascended 50 days later, 40 days later, which would be end of May, maybe very early June, and then Pentecost would be somewhere about uh, still also also in the early part of June, um, in still in the year AD 31. The next thing we can tie down was in AD 34, three and a half years later. That's at the end of the 490 year prophecy set aside for the Jews. And what happened at that point? Stephen was stoned. stoned. Stephen was stoned. And then what happens immediately following that? Gospel went to the Gentiles. Look at, look at Acts 8, verse 1. There's a very clear discussion there. And Saul approved of his murder. We know about that. Then that very day the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. All the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the province of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men buried Stephen mourning for him with loud cries. Verse 2. So what happened as a result of the stoning of Stephen? Scattered. Instead of stomping it out, it scattered like seed. It scattered like seed before the, the wild winds of autumn or whatever, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, what happens next chronologically that we know about? About a year later, we don't know exactly the length of time, but about a year later, Paul had his conversion experience on the Damascus Road. That We're now up to AD 35. And that story is in Acts 9, 1 to 19. Then from AD 35 to 38, what happened with Paul? He, he escaped took a sabbatical. From, yeah. He escaped from Damascus. He went out into the Arabian Desert, he calls it. If you read in, in, in Galatians, um, that would be Galatians 1, somewhere between 18 and 21. And what happened there, he spent three years. He basically had a fruit basket upset experience. He said, I know the Old Testament inside and out. Now I have to rethink it in light of the fact that Jesus is the Messiah prophesied by the Old Testament. And Jesus is also, I might add, we need to remember, is the God of the Old Testament. 
So somehow or other we have to fit our God experiences from the Old Testament into the same person that was Jesus here on this earth for those, uh, well, his ministry was those three and a half years. Then, uh, but when, after those th approximately three years he was out in the desert, what did Paul do? He returned to Damascus, spent a little while there, and he preached so powerfully that the, the Jews and the people there were determined to kill him. They had to let him down in a basket over the wall, and then what happened? He went to Jerusalem. What kind of reception did he get in Jerusalem? A little coolish. A little coolish? There were three groups that, that he probably hoped to, to be able to, to reach when he got to Jerusalem. Can you think of who they would be? His former members of the Sanhedrin that he was okay. with. Okay, and the Jewish, the Jewish people in general, but the, especially the Sanhedrin. They're the ones who had sent him to Damascus, weren't they? Okay, can you think of another group you probably wanted to reach? The Christians. The, the Christian church. Yeah. He wanted to convince them that he was genuine, right? The Christian church. And what other, one other group that the Bible really doesn't talk about, but I'm sure he also wanted to, to reach, and that would be his family. There were fam he had family members around Jerusalem. I'm sure he tried, I don't know whether they just totally rejected him. We don't know what happened, but I'm sure he, w he at least attempted to try to, to have some contact with them. And how long did he stay in Jerusalem? Only a short time. He did meet the Christian leaders, but God told him what? Get out of here, they'll kill you. And where did he go? Tarsus. Back to Tarsus. And he's back in Tarsus for about 10 or 11 years. And we don't know what he did during all that time. Probably he was trying to, you know, preach the gospel up there, whether he was supporting himself, making tents. We just don't know. About six years later, during that time, James the Apostle and brother of John, this would be one of the disciples, remember the James and John of the, of the disciples, that John was martyred. Peter was in prison at Passover time, then miraculously released, and at about the same time, Agrippa died. Peter's released miraculously with those 16 soldiers, remember, who were guarding him, and, and he, 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 um, he escaped. Then in AD 44-45, about that same time, Barnabas took Paul to Antioch. Paul remained there a whole year. Barnabas had gone up, and, and it's very interesting. Look at, something very interesting happened. Look at, and I like to point this out. Look at uh, Acts 11, and look at verse 19. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, telling the message to Jews only. What was their mess? Who was their message being carried to? Jews. Jews only, okay? But other believers who were from Cyprus and Cyrene, by the way, today, where are Cyprus and Cyrene? Cyprus is in the Mediterranean, yeah. Mediterranean and uh, Cyrene is Libya. Libya. And where did these people from Libya go? Went to Antioch, and where is Antioch? Syria. In Syria. So Christian missionaries went from Libya to Syria. Just to sort of get that nailed down in your minds. And proclaim the message to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. So whereas all the Jews that had been from Palestine felt compelled to spread the gospel only to other Jews, these people who heard the message and were so excited about it, what did they do? They said, this is a message can't be just for Jews only. They said what the Greek literature says, they, they spread the message to anybody who would speak Greek. That's, that's basically what, if you speak Greek, brother, let me tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ. And these people, the first ones to just made it, make an intentional effort to spread the gospel to Gentiles, we don't even know their names. And what did, uh, what did these people say to these? Well, and they said, let me tell you about Jesus. What did they say? Presumably they told the story, and they probably modeled what they said after the, what Jesus had told the men on the way to, to the, on the road to Emmaus. And where do we have that recorded? That's in Luke 24. So no, started, that's the road to Emmaus, but where do we have what Jesus said? Oh, well, there are some hints about that in, in, the, in the book Desire... Uh, 
Can I remember the exact pages? No, I don't remember. Well, Presumably, even. that's the conversation that uh, Stephen, the format that Stephen followed in his sermon. And, yeah. And uh, Acts six. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Acts seven. Yeah. And a bunch of the other sermons yes. in the mm -hmm. Book of Acts. Of course, it, when it talks about the road to Emmaus, doesn't it say that Jesus started in the Old Testament and 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 went through the prophecies and yeah. how it all pointed to him and so yeah. on and so forth. So, but how's a Greek over in Antioch going to some guy shows up there with a, with a story like that. Yeah. Well, the Lord's power was with them, verse 21, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. The news about this reached the church in Jerusalem, so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw how God had blessed the people, he was glad and urged them all to be faithful and true to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus. Why? Look for See, there's too much work to be done here by one or two people. We need some help. And I remember there's somebody who's over there in Tarsus who could give us a good hand, right? And he called Saul, who later became known as Paul. But regard to your question, I, I think that there is a tremendous power when you see a prophecy outlined and then you see the fulfillment of that prophecy. And that's what they were, that's what they went through the Old Testament prophecies that pointed to Jesus and then they saw the reality of it and I think it's the same thing that we have today we've got the prophecies of Revelation and Daniel and when those are laid out it's powerful information and powerful evidence mm -hmm. well the following year in AD 45 Barnabas took Paul, uh, Paul Barnabas and Paul took um, famine relief to Jerusalem, Acts 11, 25 to 30. Then in, 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 in AD 45 to 47, Paul and Barnabas embarked on their first missionary journey, and this was an intentional effort to spread the gospel to other places. Now, they, they went to the synagogues, each place where they traveled to, went to the synagogues first, but as soon as they were rejected in the synagogues, where did they go? Anybody that would listen. Anybody would listen, just like they had been doing in Antioch, right? Yeah. If you speak Greek, we have something to say to you, right? Okay, so that was 45 to 47. They came back finally and spent about a year or so back in Antioch. And <clears throat> um, then the word, the word went out that these people had been out and they are converting Gentiles by the handful. And that was very worrisome to some groups. Who were they? The Judaizers. The, well, the, the Christians, the Jewish Christians back in Jerusalem who felt like things were getting a little out of hand here. You might have more Greeks in the church than oh, you had. Oh, dear. <laughs> more Gentiles more than Jews? Ge more Gentiles than Jews. Huh? Oh, boy, that would be an awful situation. And so what happened? They said, we need to discuss this. And so the, the you know, people came up from Jerusalem and said, you know, this, we're not too sure about all these Gentiles joining the church. So Paul and Barnabas said, okay, we're on our way to Jerusalem. We're going to have a conference down there. We're going to settle this problem once and for all. And how did they go about doing that? They had a great conference, a big gathering, and that's spelled out in Acts chapter 15. And we will turn there when we come back. The, big, the first general conference to be held at Jerusalem, Acts 15. Open your Bibles when we get back.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. Acts 15 is a very interesting chapter. We won't have time to go through it in detail, but it's interesting to see what they concluded and why they concluded it. Uh, look at um, Acts 15, starting with verse 22. Then the disciples and the elders, together with the whole church, decided to choose some men from the group and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Now they're going to the place where they first had preached the gospel to Gentiles, right? They chose, excuse me, they chose two men who were highly respected by the believers, Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, and they sent the following letter to them. We, the apostles and the elders, your brothers, send greetings to all our brothers of Gentile birth who live in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. What important city is in Cilicia, do you remember? That's Paul's home, Tarsus. We have, we have heard that some who want, went from our group have troubled and upset you by what they said. They had not, however, received any instruction from us. And so we have met together and have all agreed to choose some messengers and send them to you. They will go with our dear, brother, dear friends, Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. We send you then Judas and Silas, who will tell you in person the same things we are writing. The Holy Spirit and we... Now, did they have divine, divine uh, commission behind what they had to say? The Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to put any other burden on you besides these necessary rules. Eat no food that has been offered to idols. Eat no blood. Eat no animal that has been strangled. And keep yourselves from sexual immorality. You will do well if you take care not to do these things with our best wishes. Now, let's, how you're saved? Okay, that's the question. Is this some kind of a new gospel we got here? What, what, what is this? What, what are these instructions, these four points? This has nothing to do with these are how, to, how to get along at church. This is how to get along at church. If you're a Gentile and you think, you think you'd like to go to church and sit next to a Jew, you better follow these rules. The Jews are not going to be happy with you if you're breaking these rules. And if you're a Jew and a Gentile sits with you who believes this, you better accept him. Yeah, exactly. Well, okay. So that was, the, that was the famous council. Paul talks about what happened 14 years later, Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. And we, we time that at, at AD 49. That same year, Paul started on his second missionary journey, this time taking Silas, because Barnabas took John Mark and went to uh, Cyprus and on. Paul went to Phrygia, Galatia, and entered into Europe. Remember, the, the angel said, come over to Macedonia and help us. So this is Saul, Paul's second missionary journey. It happened between the years 50 and 51. Paul reached as far as Corinth, where he stayed a year and a half, and during that time he wrote First and Second Thessalonians. Now, it's possible that James was written earlier, back somewhere between 45 to 47. We're not really sure. That's the only other book that might have been written before First and Second Thessalonians. We're just not completely sure. In AD 52, the second missionary journey ended, and Paul spent a considerable amount of time back at Antioch. It says that in Acts 18, verse 23. From 53 to 58, Paul's third missionary journey, what did he do? He traveled through Asia Minor, stayed three years at Ephesus. On the way home from his second missionary journey, he had promised to the Ephesians he would come back. He now spends three years at Ephesus, and during that time, heard about the problems at Corinth and sent those letters. Actually, it turns out there were four letters he sent to the Corinthians. We'll talk about that when we get to talking about the uh, Corinthian letters. Um, and following his three years, he felt, those three years, he felt things were so bad in, in Corinth that he needed to go over there. He ended up having to walk all the way around, which is hundreds of miles. Um, and in the process, he, he had written a, a very strong letter to them. Titus came back and said, they accepted your letter. Please come. They want to talk to you again. They want to see you. And Paul went down to Corinth and over the winter of AD 57 and 58, he wrote Galatians and Romans. We'll get to those books later. Then he went back to Jerusalem carrying a very generous offering for the Christians back in Jerusalem. 
And what was the result? Went to prison. Arrested. Well, they suggested that he had to prove that he was still a real Jew, and he took that vow, and he was found in the temple, and he was arrested. And he spent the next couple of years in jail in what, what's officially called Caesarea Maritima, uh, not at Jerusalem because the people of Jerusalem would uh, try to tear him limb from limb. And then finally in the spring, somewhere probably 60 or 61, he um, prob probably in the fall of AD 60, he, he finally appeals to Rome and the, and the Roman centurion says, okay, if you're going to appeal to Caesar, we'll put you on a boat and we'll send you there. And it was at that point that he went through that shipwreck experience that we know about ending up in Malta. Uh, he arrived in Rome in the spring of AD 61. From AD 61 to 63, Paul was a prisoner in Rome, it says in Acts 20, verse 38, two whole years. And near the end of that time, he, he got hints somehow or other that, and, he, and what was he doing during that time? Was he just sitting quietly in, in this he was under house arrest, sort of. He, had, he was allowed to get his own house to pay rent, but the Roman guards came to, to guard him there. And what happened? He wrote books. Not only did he write books, he converted, converted a bunch of Roman soldiers from the Praetorian Guard, from Caesar's own, what, what he called Caesar's own household. Amazing. Well, near the end of that time, when it looked like he was going to be released from prison, he wrote Ephesians. Colossians, both those were pretty much at exactly the time, same time, and Philemon. Those three books were carried by a couple of people who went that direction. Shortly thereafter, he probably wrote Philippians. That went, they went with another man. And it's possible that Hebrew was, was written during that time also. Then from 63 to 66, two and a half or three years, Paul was released from Roman prisoner, prison. He traveled to Crete, to Asia Minor, to Macedonia. First Timothy was written, Titus was written, First Peter was probably also written during that time, um, and the, book, the small book of Jude was probably written during that time. Why do some people dispute the fact that he wrote Hebrews? Because it doesn't say anywhere in Hebrews clearly who wrote it. That's the main, the main reason. Now, it's, he talks about Timothy being with him, and we know that Timothy was with Paul most of the time. So that's the, maybe one little hint. but. Um, and the other reason why people question about Hebrews uh, is because the language in Hebrews is very different. The Greek in Hebrews is very different than Paul's other writings. In fact, the language in Hebrews is very much like the language of Luke and Acts, the language of Dr. Luke. So I tend to want to believe that it was Paul's theology, but it was Luke's Greek, the, what we have in the book of Hebrews. Of course, I can't prove that, and there's other people who have different theories, but that's what seems most reasonable to me. Then in AD 66, what happened? First siege of Jerusalem. The first siege of Jerusalem. And uh, Paul was rearrested. In that second pr imprisonment, he wrote Second Timothy, and Second Peter was also written by Peter. They very likely were both in prison in that Mamertine prison at the same time. Mamertine prison was cut out of solid rock and it's still there. You can go and visit it if you go to Rome. Then uh, AD 67, Peter and Paul both were, uh, Peter was um, hung, crucified upside down, Paul was beheaded with the Roman axe, and the book of Acts was probably written, or at least finished up, by Dr. Luke. Then in AD 70, three years later, Jerusalem was destroyed, and finally jumping way over to chapter to Acts, I mean, to AD 90 to 96, John was arrested, sent to Patmos by Domitian, but first of all, he was, he, remember they tried to get rid of him by throwing him into a pot, a pot of boiling oil and he didn't cook? And they had to pull him back out of the boiling oil because he, he just sat there. He didn't, he didn't die. So they said, we'll take care of this. We'll send him off to the Isle of Patmos and where he wrote, from the Isle of Patmos, he wrote the book of Revelation and finally, Shortly thereafter, he was released, apparently again, we returned to Ephesus, where he had been head of the church at Ephesus for a number of years. And from there, he wrote what? Gospel of John. The Gospel of John and the three short letters, uh, first, second, and third John. And that's the best we can do at putting together 
the historic or the history of the Book of Acts and of the early church. Any questions about you know, that? We went through it fairly quickly. Once again, I would remind you that if you look at the teacher's guides under Acts, you can get this sequence. It's the first page of the study guide for the Book of Acts. I should say the teacher's guide for the Book of Acts. Okay, well, let's go back and talk a little bit about the major points in the Book of Acts. The Book of Acts talks about the, what happened immediately, and we need to start with Acts 1 and just look at a couple of verses there really quickly that sort of set the stage. The first interesting verse is verse 6. When the apostles met together with Jesus, now this is just before his ascension, they asked, Lord, will you at this time give the kingdom back to Israel? What, are they still sort of secretly hoping in their hearts? Get rid of the Romans. That he's going to turn out to be the king of Israel like they had been hoping all along and, and somehow deal with the Romans. Well, what I have a feeling that this was their last answer and they knew it. Mm -hmm. so. Jesus said to them, the times and occasions are set by my Father's own authority and it is not for you to know when they will be. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up to heaven as they watched him and a cloud hid him from their sight. And by the way, Ellen White tells us that was what kind of a cloud? A cloud of angels. They still had their eyes fixed on the sky as he went away when two men dressed in white suddenly stood beside them and said, Galileans, why are you standing there looking up at the sky? This Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Marvelous promise, isn't it? So over the next little while, what happened? They chose a successor for Judas who had committed suicide. Um, Peter and Paul had a chance to, well, especially Peter, but probably the other disciples as well, um, preached on, Pe on Pentecost morning. And how many were baptized to join the church? They weren't necessarily baptized, but joined. 3,000 men, right? 3,000 men, not counting women and children. And the message of that is, is there in Acts 2. And then a, a, the, the, the lame man was healed by Peter and John a while later. But just as a note, this is one of those sermons that they may have gotten from Jesus yeah. on the road to Emmaus. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, one of those. That pattern probably is what happened. And then um, as a result of their healing the beggar at the, at the beautiful gate outside the temple, there was a big discussion with, with um, the Sanhedrin that we talked about in Acts chapter 4. Then there's the story of Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the Holy Spirit. And what happened to them? Died, Died on the church floor. Died on the church floor. You better not be unfaithful with your church offerings, right? <laughs> By the way, why doesn't God do that? Um, you know, the church is suffering from funds. If God did this a little bit once in a while, wouldn't that help the offerings to pick up? This didn't work then. Didn't work then? I think teach so. you to stay out of church. <laughs> well, the next really important thing they did is they chose what? Seven deacons. And who was the two most important of those deacons that we know about? Stephen, Stephen who gave that famous speech in Acts, incredible speech in Acts 7. And Philip, who's going who's gonna to star over the next few chapters, went to Samaria and began to preach the gospel. So we know here that at this point in time, after the stoning of Stephen, we already read the verse, what happened? The Christians were scattered out of Jerusalem in that area and scattered all over the place. And the gospel, had thus, the gospel thus spread out from Jerusalem. Did the majority go to some place? A majority of them went over across the Jordan into Perea. Perea. Yeah. And they, so they weren't very far from Jerusalem, but they were, they were out of the reach of the Sanhedrin and of the Jewish people, because they weren't, the Jewish people were not the primary uh, people and responsible for what was going on over there in Perea. Egypt had been a favorite place for them to go in prior times too. Did they do that? Very likely. This time also? Very likely, yeah. Uh, Alexandria became a, a great center for the Christian church 
uh, later down in Egypt. Then Paul had that experience on the Damascus Road. Incredible experience. By, what, by the way, what did change with Paul on the Damascus Road? He did, new, he, did he, he change his Sabbath? God. Didn't change his Sabbath. Did he change the name of his God? No. Did he stop believing in the Old Testament? No. What did change? He believed in Jesus, and that gave him a completely new picture of God. The only thing that really changed on the Damascus Road was his picture of God. And what does that tell us? Maybe we ought to look at our pictures. Wow. <laughs> Maybe if we had a correct picture of God, something marvelous would happen to us, huh? Well, Paul preached in Damascus. He went out into Arabia. He came back to Damascus, went to Jerusalem, and off to, Tar to uh, Tarsus. And we've talked about the experience with Paul and Barnabas and the missionary journeys. And that takes up um, the next, most of the rest of the, of the book of Acts. Gordon, what was the significance of the Cornelius experience? Peter yeah, we should Cornelius maybe touch on that. Acts 10. Yeah, Paul, I'm sorry, keep saying Paul. Peter, what was Peter doing in Acts 10? Or just before that, Acts 9? Peter was spending time with the Gentiles. Peter was down at Joppa on the coast of Palestine and who's he living? Who's he living with or staying a with? A tanner. What does a tanner do? Deals with skins dead. and blood. And he yeah. deals with dead creatures all the time. He's perpetually defiled according to Jewish law. Right? Is that why it was safe for Peter to stay there? <laughs> no Jew would want to enter the place. <laughs> I thought of that. <laughs> That's, it's possible. Safe place for him. A good, a good place, a safe place for Peter to stay for that very reason. But he had already started to give up his, his let's say at least his, his restrictions, his Jewish restrictions were starting to relax a little, huh? Yeah. Relax a little. And then what happened? That famous vision, the sheet that came down out of the sky with all those unclean creatures in it. And Peter was waiting for lunch, right? And God said, rise and eat in the vision. And three times the sheet came down. And what did Peter keep saying? No, I've never eaten anything like that. And what was the result? Peter realized a little while later, as they, they were eating or just after they ate, what happened? Three people arrived. I think it was three. And what did they say? Come with us to Come Cornelius. Come on up to our house. Yeah. Cornelius was a... Roman centurion, not a Jew, not even pretending to be a Jew. Now, what did we know about Rome, Cornelius' religious experience? He was very friendly to the Jews. He was a follower of the way in a sense um, because he had, he had more or less adopted the Jewish religion. He hadn't been circumcised, hadn't become fully a Jew, but he had more or less adopted the religion, Jewish religion. He was praying to God. And Peter went up to his place. And who did Peter take with him? Took a bunch of witnesses. A lot of witnesses. He said, I, I got I to gotta be, I got to make sure that everybody knows what, what's going on here. What, and, why was it that he went? The men asked him to come. Mm -hmm. The three men asked him. But in Acts 10, 20... Uh, the Holy Spirit says, so get ready and go down and do not hesitate to go with them for I have sent them. <coughs> right, exactly. So he, he was instructed by God. Direct instructions from God. And he went to Cornelius' house and Cornelius had brought a lot of other, who in, who, what other people he brought in? His family and a bunch of friends. And Peter went into this Gentile's house, ate with him and preached to him there. And what happened? They received the Holy Spirit just as we had back at Pentecost. We don't know exactly what all that meant, but Peter I, said... They must have had quite a conversation on the way home. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Must have had quite a conversation in Cornelius' house. Yes. Yeah. And quite a conversation when they got back to Jerusalem, too. Yes. The people said... You went into a Roman centurion's house and you sat down with him and you ate with him. What were you thinking? 
God well, told me to. There was this little problem of tongues <laughs> of fire over their head. <laughs> God told me to go up there, and I have all the witnesses I need here. You know, he he said he told these brethren, "You got to come up to Jerusalem with me." You know, and there were all the witnesses. And they he said, must have had some kind of rebels with him, though, because they had to go up and eat too. Mm -hmm. Yep. It must have been quite and a they crowd. they saw the Holy Spirit come down on these people. And what happened when all these people gave their witness? <coughs> the brethren in Jerusalem said, so be it. Yep. The evidence is spread out in front of us. We got all the witnesses. What can we say? People who assume that uh, Paul worked with uh, animal skin as well when he was building tent. tents. Are they awesome. correct? Uh -huh. Well, we don't, there was a special kind of tent that the Roman government uh, required, a, a specified tent the Roman government required for, for their soldiers to, to sleep in and to stay in. And I understand that at least part of that was made out of leather. We speculate that Paul, one of the things Paul did was made those special tents that, were, that the Roman government used. And so they were, there was a constant demand for them. So, yes, possibly he, Paul, worked with skins as well. We, we don't know that for sure, but it's quite possible. The response of the church leaders in Jerusalem is in Acts 11, yes. 18, when they, that is the church leaders, heard this, the story about uh, that you've told, they stopped their criticism and praised God, saying, then God has given to the Gentiles also the opportunity to repent and live. And so they all went out and began preaching to Gentiles, right? Nope. <laughs> okay, Peter, you got away with this, but that doesn't mean the rest of us are going to be following your example. But it, it was wasn't a big change. Yes, because the change came about because of Antioch that we already talked about. And up there in Antioch... Later. huh? That was a, just a little bit later. Oh, just a little <laughs> bit later. Up there in Antioch, remember, they were first called Christians. And then from that experience, Paul went on his first missionary journey, his second missionary journey, his third missionary journey. And then, of course, when he got back to Jerusalem, he listened to James and some of the other church leaders and uh, ended up getting himself arrested and spent the, most of the rest of his life in, in prison. And the book of Acts takes us down through those experiences step by step. We obviously don't have time to read the whole thing, but um, it's very interesting how it ends. Look over, in, well, we should say just a couple words. Uh, who did Paul preach to in the process of his uh, imprisonments, etc.? Anybody that listened? A lot of really important people. Kings, Felix and Festus, and then King Agrippa, and then finally, who did he, who did he witness before? Nero. Caesar himself, Nero. At, at least twice that we know of. And Caesar's household, the soldiers that worked for Caesar. This was an incredible experience. I mean, imagine, you realize that, you know, even speaking about Christ potentially could be a life-threatening experience. People would cut off your heads for that. And Paul just said, Nero, I want you to hear, this is what I have to say. Wow. So he preached to the Secret Service? Basically, equivalent. yes. A yes. question and converted them? Sorry. Yeah. About Acts 14, 19 to 20. Okay. Because I believe many people uh, believe that Paul had been resurrected. Oh. Because they misunderstood the... Mm -hmm. Did you say something about well, that? Well, they, he was stoned and probably knocked unconscious. They dragged him out of the city. And then what happened? Thinking he was dead. Read it. Some Jews came from Antioch and Pisidia and from the Iconium. They won the crowds over to their side stoned Paul and dragged him out of the town thinking that he was dead. But when he, the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into town. The next day, he and Barnabas went to Derby. So we're assuming that wasn't a complete death, that he was probably knocked unconscious by one of those stones, and then he survived. I think what they found really incredible is the, because the distance between where he was stoned and where he was the next day. Yeah. How he was able to... God was with him through it all, yeah. through it all. Yeah. Well, uh, after all the witnessing before all those famous people, what happened to Paul? He was released from prison for a short time. Then he was beheaded, wasn't he? As a Roman citizen, he had the right to appeal to Caesar. That's why he was sent to Rome. And he also had what other right? 
that if he had committed a crime as, as perceived in the eyes of Caesar, he could die by beheading and not by crucifixion, right? So that's, that's what happened. Um, by the way, why, why do you think Paul was released for that maybe two, two and a half years between his first imprisonment in Rome and his second imprisonment in Rome? Any idea? Not quite sure? Yeah, work to do. <laughs> yeah, but if you read the writings of Ellen White, it, all, it seems to imply that no Jew showed up to accuse him. He spoke his side of the argument, and there wasn't really anybody to accuse him. And Nero, probably in his impatience, just said, if there's nobody to argue against you, go. So it seems likely that that was what happened. He was anxious to go to Spain, wasn't he? Yeah, he wanted why to go he didn't up and get, get out of there. Why didn't, did he turn himself in, or was he arrested again? No, he was arrested again. He went back to his old haunts and, and probably was arrested in Troas. But Ken, how does the book of Acts help us in our picture of God? Oh, that's a very good, good question. The book of Acts is the only authentic history we have of the early, uh, early history of the church. This is where we have to fit everything. Now, it doesn't, doesn't tell the whole story. If you look at how it ends, let's just look at that for a second. Acts 28, and Paul concluded, You are to know then that God's message of salvation has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. For two years, Paul lived in a place he rented for himself. This is his first imprisonment in Rome. And there he welcomed all who came to see him. He preached about the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking with all boldness and freedom. Bang, and it just ends like that. And many, many people looking at that said, no doubt he planned to write a volume three. <laughs> he wrote Luke, the story of Jesus. Now he writes Acts, the first part, and he probably should, planned to write a second part, which apparently never got, never got written. But from this, we get the picture of how God turned a scared little bunch of people uh, that were hiding behind locked doors into a force that moved the then known world. Their enemy, and their, even their enemies said, these people have turned the world upside down. And that's really the story of Acts. And we'll use that framework to, face, to place the rest of our, our books of the New Testament in. See you next week.